Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. As-salatu salam ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear brothers and sisters, I welcome you and those who will come in the future. And on Jorama to my Fulbe community everywhere you may be and this is a topic that probably will require a couple of uh, sessions in order to get it right as you can see by the title uh, Sudan another failed African state is a failed African state now and we have a major crisis and we always have to always remember something about Africa, regardless of where it's at, if it's in Mozambique or South Africa or Fes Morocco or, or Cairo, Egypt, wherever the place may be, we're, we're all Africans. These are brothers and sisters. And when they are in dire need, crisis, even though you may not be able to help, at least you can lend a prayer uh, for the upliftment of, of the Sudanese people in this regard and that there will be peace because the continent is in a turbulent state as I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my dear sister Amina. So brothers and sisters, let's start this here. The Sudanese government, the prior government, uh, betrayed its people, essentially. And, and because of this betrayal, it is now a failed state. It is starting to go downhill from that point. And so the Sudanese, uh, Sudan proper is a newly created failed state. South Sudan also is right behind it. It's mired in a lot of conflicts, corruption, and so forth. So it's right behind it. Here, Sudan was one big country, the biggest country in Africa at one time, then it split it in half, you know the story. And South Sudan is marred in a lot of conflict, ethnic conflicts and so forth and so on. And so here we have on the brink of that two failed states. Then we have Libya to the north. So we have successions of failed African states, new. And it's really a shame because we know who's behind it. But again, the Western powers cannot perpetrate the crimes, the treachery, and the, the malfeasance that is doing without the black faces to assist them. In this case, the Sudan, Sudanese government assisted in the downfall of its people, of its government and, and the letting down of people. And you see what has happened now. We have Sudan. Who, who are trying to go everywhere. We've had over 500, they say, have been murdered. And, uh, and it's not getting any better. And so we have to look at some, some issues here, brothers and sisters. How do we get to this point? And as you heard me talk about previously here, we have two factions here. We have the government forces, who are supported basically by the West. Then we have the RSF, who were the formerly the Junjui, remember? It means that the, the devil on a horse. I, I don't like to use that term unless I have to in order for recognition so someone know because you're not gonna see the names I'm present to you today in print mostly. You always see Junjui, I'm using it in this context. But if you understood it in Arabic language, it's not complimentary at all. Um, the one of the things I'm going to get into some points about this. You saw the marquee. I got to explain some things about what may transpire. Uh, Sudan is a, a failed state, as we know right now. It's failed. And it's going to take a lot of money, time, and patience to rebuild it and to bring back the trust. The Sudanese people themselves, too, are at blame because when you begin to ask for what Subhan wa has told you, don't ask for it and don't try to use, they ask for it anyway. 
and they rioted in the streets. They forced the new government and the, the makeshift uh, ad hoc government that they were trying to run to, to hurry up the process. And you can't do that because when you use democracy, each person has his own version of democracy. This is what makes this, this particular governance so dangerous. As you can see in the United States or France, Britain, any of these places like this, the, 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 the laws are evolving and they never really evolve correctly because Subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that the governance that he has laid for, and I, you heard me say this many times before too, the, the, the Western states claim to be staunch Christian nations, and yet they do not use the Torah, which they're supposed to be using as governance of, of its people. They use what they want to use. So now the Sudanese people have picked up on this and is and everywhere in the Muslim states now, is everywhere, everybody's screaming for democracy. The man to my right thinks democracy is in one way. The man on my left thinks of direct democracy on another. The sisters, uh, the most uh, modern sisters look at democracy as now as time freedom. I can remove my hijab. I can go in the streets naked. I can be like Beyonce. I can look like this actress here. If I want to have boyfriends, I can do this. See, this is, and each one has its own version of what democracy should be. This is the problem. Brothers and sisters, the root cause of all of the turmoil inside the United States basically today, it begins with the U.S. security agreements. This is a fact. The U.S. security agreements is a betrayal of the African people because the government is now indirectly ruled by the U.S. government. It's common knowledge. Everybody knows this. Meaning everybody knows I'm talking about in, in, the, in the, the international community, you know, the Americans have been strong. 400 years, they've had 400 years to, to master their craft on, on ruling us. 400 years. They know how to take resources out. They know how to enslave. They know how to take black faces, women and children, and enslave them for 200 and some years. They know how to do that. They know how to take the resources out. They know how to run indirect rule. And as you've seen the last couple of weeks, they know how to overthrow our governments. They know how to cause friction in the land. They had 400 years to work this out. If you give me 400 years to learn how to do something to somebody, I, I think I'll be able to perfect, uh, perfect my craft. This is what they've done. The U.S. security agreements are with the majority of the African states. It's designed to initiate the procedures of creating a failed state because it runs adverse to what the African ideals are. And only certain people in the governments buy by this, but the people suffer from it. This is why Subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in the Quran, if you heard me say weeks back when I gave tafsir on Surah Nisa, uh, there was a higher uh, verse 141, Subhanahu wa ta'ala says he would not allow the disbelievers to put their way on the on the Muslims, meaning they will not be able to achieve ultimate victory. That's one of the the the, the tef, one of the portions of the tafsir of that. When you begin to ask for what Supan Matala told you in this verse, don't ask for it. Don't ask to put the way of disbelievers, your enemy, on your brother. The Muslims across the board today have done this. They've used the 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 the, the enemies governance, their rules, their laws, in order to govern over the Muslims. The Muslims in, in Muslim states in particular are using the, the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah, they may be wayward here and there, but they're still Muslims. The government turns back around and go away from the Quran and the Sunnah. You're going to have conflict. Here's the people here. This is what has happened in Muslim states. You have the Muslims here, you have the government here who's de de democracy related. And then you have the the rogue elements of the, the people who are paid by, by rogue governments, you know, rogue actors who come into the country and, and formulate by passing money out, hey, getting the youth to run to uh, put signs of talking about democracy, democracy, democracy. This is the failure, brothers and sisters. This is the first step of the failure. Disagreement here, your rights is gone. They have veto power. When you say, look, I want sim immigration, I want to have the the, the, the Rohingya, say from uh, from uh, from uh, Myanmar to come. 
They'll say, no, we don't want that. They have veto power over your decisions. When you say, like what has happened now many times, and I have to bring this up, many of the African states say, look, we want to bring home our, our lost brothers and sisters because we we, we helped in, in, in to enslave their ancestors, and now we want to bring them back. The U.S. government says yes to a certain degree. You can only have certain people, but you put stringent methods so they can't get citizenship, and they're doing this. You see, this is a security agreement that they have that has veto power over your decisions, especially with security. Then they begin to run all of the intelligence agencies and your military. The people, yeah, you have generals and lieutenants and, and so forth and so on, but the overseer of that is somebody from the U.S. government who have veto power again to tell you what to do and what not to do. This is the, the, the recipe for disaster. So when the insurgency begins, you notice something, the US abandons the ship. When you have a security agreement that's supposed to state that they will protect you and our governments go in cahoots with the U.S. government because they want to stay in power and they trust them. But when the insurgency comes down, the U.S. pulls out and leave you to your fate. This is what we've seen in Libya. This is what we've seen in Sudan today. We've seen this in Guinea. We've seen this in Mali. We've seen this in many different African states, especially the Muslim states. They leave them to their own fate and you see what has happened. Secondly, the former Sudan, Sudan government under Bashir abandoned the Sharia law. You know what, Sudan, let me tell you something. When I was in 2008, two, part of 2009, I was so mesmerized with what I saw in Sudan. I was mesmerized. They had so much food, brothers and sisters. I never tasted fish from the Neil before until I got there. I was mesmerized. I saw the abundance of food. I saw this. I saw the happiness of the people. I saw things that, that, you know, I was very, very pleased because I have ancestry there. All that's gone by the wayside. And when I was there, the brothers was telling me, say, look, yeah, yeah, it's, about, it's changing now. Because they, uh, one brother in particular began to show me the downtown area of, of there, well, they have about three or four downtown areas, big, uh, soaps and so forth, where Western clothing began to be introduced. They were telling the brothers now have to remove the ema, remove their, their toes to start putting on, uh, uh, you know, uh, clothes uh, from the West. So it, things are starting to change. The, the, the sisters begin to wear very tight fitting clothing. All this began to add up. Then Brashir signed the agreement with Israel and, and gave Israel the right to have airspace over Sudan. It makes matters worse, Israel bombed Sudan on top of that because they said there was a plant that was used by the Mujahideen groups to take weapons from this plant, from this plant there, and they bombed and killed some Sudanese people. There was no retaliation because you remember the formula, the way the West does it. The West will arm the black nations, okay, the black nations, black faces and brown faces, Afro -Arab faces, they'll arm them to kill their own folks, not to go fight another tuba, but to kill their own folks and to kill other Africans. This is what they armed them. See, not to go kill the, the Israelis or anybody else, only to kill other blacks, only to kill other Afro Arabs or the Afro Amazir. That's what the, the, why they're armed to the teeth. They spend millions and millions on aircraft, high tech military madness to kill other Africans. This is the truth. Brashir didn't stop there. He began to dismantle the, the Sharia. Then he began to arrest the scholars. He then dismantled the Islamic famous schools that Malcolm X even went to for a while. And his one of the greatest teachers came, was one of the, the masterminds of some of the schools there. He began to disrupt that. And he disbanded those schools. Famous Imam schools, you got famous African-Americans uh, my age and older, who went to those schools there to train to come back to be fabulous imams inside the United States, they got their training, a lot of them in Sudan. 
those schools are gone. He allowed hard them to be reintroduced into the country. He then abandoned and disbanded the Sharia police. Then they pushed because the people are black. They don't identify with the Tubab, but they identify with black folk in America for obvious reasons because they're black people. They look, you know, no different. I walk the street, nobody knows I'm an American. They think I'm Sudan. So they adopted African American cultural things, haircuts, styles, rapping, uh, you name it. The sisters begin to adapt some of the, the actresses and some of the ladies uh, who sing and so forth and so on. They begin to adopt that. This was pushed on them. You see the picture, brothers and sisters? Subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't like that. See, he didn't like that. Then, that government allowed the Americans to indirectly rule the land. The Sudanese officials miscalculated the all of the above, thinking that the Americans would keep them in power and they were betrayed in the end, as they always do. When now Brashir was under fire, he looked to the Americans to help him. They turned their back on him. The only people who were ready to help him was a fellow Otter from the Jews. I won't get into that because if you know the story, I won't get into that what happened when they found his house. I won't get into that because that's immaterial now. But I'm just talking about how Sudan has led to this point right now. The Americans betrayed him. See, and there was a reason for that betrayal. Because the failed state of Sudan, no, I don't want to get to that right now. Let me back off that. Let me back off that. Let me let me give you something uh, else here um, that I, let me see, where's my notes here? Uh, okay. Uh, the, in the security agreements, remember what I said earlier, the Americans run the intelligence agencies of Sudan. They run the military. Did you see the military today? Who do you think, where they got their training from, more or less? Where they get their funding from? When the CIA calls from them, they come running. See? And so they control that. When it was time to remove Brashir, who gave the who you think gave the, the okay for it? Was it the Russians? Was it the Japanese? Was it the Chinese? Was it you, me? No. It was the Americans gave them the authority to overthrow Brashir, and they did, because they were controlling the military. They controlled the, the intelligence agencies in Sudan. And so we're at the stage now. This is the same formula that's happened over and over again in Africa, the same formula. So we at the, we're at the state now where the, the Sudanese government is failed, it's gone. The people are abandoning, people are trying to leave, people are dying as we speak. There's bombs being leveled all over the place. And our brothers and sisters are suffering. If you saw some of the videotapes of some now Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah for them, they open up their borders to allow the boat. There's a boat, a ferry boat. I've always wanted to take that. I don't know why I had this thing about that, but I wanted to take the ferry from Port Sudan into to, uh, Yemen or to Saudi Arabia, but I couldn't do it. But they took the ferry boat into Saudi Arabia and they were welcomed uh, there and so forth and so on. And if you looked at the faces, you see that our brothers and sisters of Sudan were, have really suffered a trauma, something they didn't ask for, something they didn't bargain for, and they've been betrayed, brothers and sisters. So again, these are our, fo our fellow Africans. These are our brothers and sisters, okay, on the continent. So we sh they should deserve our prayers. We should ask that Sudan be restored and that our, the, our brothers and sisters who are now all over the place running there into Chad, they went into Egypt. Now they're in Saudi Arabia, uh, that they find solace and peace and they're protected because they deserve that. Because that's our brothers and sisters. Bottom line, they're, they're Africans. They're not aliens, they're Africans. And that's our brothers and sisters. Now, I'm bringing you to a point, brothers and sisters, for a reason why I talked about this, because I want the backdrop. Because I saw some programs that's been handed down by some African-Americans and I was appalled at what they said. 
One I saw last night was so disgraceful that she finally pulled the plug, and I'm happy she did do pull the plug because she misnamed Sudan, not understanding that Sudan is an Arabic word coming from another root word, meaning black. <laughs> she didn't know. So she got on there to talk about Sudan, and she and she said that, that, that Sudan has another name, and it's not true. And she said, sudden. There's no such word in Arabic language like that. Sudan comes from another root word, solda, black, okay? But she didn't know that, and she shouldn't have. I, I wanted to warn the sister, please, sister, stop now while you hit her. But she got the message, and she got off the she got off the air to stop because she butchered. She was not prepared. Only thing she said was the Americans were behind the the, the failed state of Sudan. She did get that correct, but she didn't understand. And I tried to get to ease her into say, look, it's the ethnic. You have to understand the ethnic. You need a you need a calling card. You need a card here with a play card here, like like basketball players. You need to know you know who they are, the numbers. That's how Sudan is. You need to understand the 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 villages, the the, the loyalties, in order to understand Sudan correctly. You just can't look at the faces and say, okay, I understand Sudan. You cannot, because you have two black people here. One may be called the Nuba people. He speak Arabic. The other one is Afro Otto. Both of them speak Arabic. But one is classified as Arabic, the other one is not, even though both speak Arabic. You have to understand that. And who is who are the, 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 the blue, blue, black, and green blacks? Is what they call them, who are they aligned with? Who are the Afro Arabs aligned with? You have to understand all of that to understand Sudan. Many of the African Americans, unfortunately, don't understand that. They get on TV and again they mislead. CNN, uh, uh, MSBC, and all these other agencies are misleading you. Even some suggest that it's a black a white auto thing against a black auto thing. You see, that's why I've been harping the last couple of weeks, brothers and sisters, learn our African history. There's no Tubab in Sudan. You understand? afro Arabs are not Tubab. The Nuba people are black, 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 okay? Green, black, and blue, black. They're not white. They're not Tubab. See, so I say that because I, I, I hate to see our brothers mislead, and I don't think they mean any harm because they want to give good news, but you have to understand what it means in Sudan. Sudan is not, Sudan is not Los Angeles. You got to understand all the ethnic, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 ties and who is Arab, who is not Arab. You, all that has to be understood about Sudan in order for you to talk about it. You, if you can't understand that, you should not talk about Sudan. It's, it's because you mislead the people and it's wrong. Now we're starting to get to the point now, brothers and sisters, we have a failed Sudan state. It's failed. It's gone. Okay. But you got two players who are trying to run the show. As you heard me talk about the other day, hmm? the government who uh, forces who are backed by the West and by some Jazeera Otto, but mostly by the West. Then you have the infamous RSF, the genuine was their former name. You heard me talk about last week again about the ethnic loyalties and divisions. Now, the Sudanese genuine or the RSF and the Fulani genuine, okay, of Nigeria, okay, the Fulani herdsmen, I'll get into this in a minute. I'm going to show you something. I'm trying to lead you to this so you can understand what's happening there in Sudan. They have a connection, brothers and sisters. Okay, they have a connection. Now, I want to, uh -oh. oh boy, what happened here? What happened here? Okay, sorry. Excuse, excuse me. Excuse me. I hope I didn't disrupt. Okay. Uh, excuse me here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, trying to get my map here of the, in English so you can understand, uh, there, here we go. Now you look at the map there, you see Sudan as it is today. You see Chad, you see Libya and Egypt over to your right. Okay. Now you see, you see where it is Nigeria. Okay. And then you see the Southern part of Chad. 
there's a connection between the Fulani and the, 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 the uh, RSF because they're kinfolk, they're cousins. A lot of people don't understand it and don't know that. But the reason, one of the reasons of the big fighting that's going on now is because the government forces now have declared that the RSF are foreigners or outsiders. They're not real Sudani. And this is the problem. So you have a connection that's going on now with the herdsmen. I will get into that so you can understand that a little bit better. So they have this connection because the, the, the afro Arabs and the Fulani, uh, uh, cattle, uh, camels, uh, grazing, so they intermarried, you understand? This is the complication that I was talking about. They intermarried and they formed uh, the nucleus of the infamous Januid who, you know, the UN were after because they said they slaughtered the green and, and, and blue blacks. But as you heard me talk about, they went into Libya because these are some strong brothers and they have a fighting force that has to be reckoned with. They're not punks, you understand? These guys are not punks. These, they, these guys are true fighters and warriors. So you have, they went into Libya. The Saudi, the Saudi government asked for them in particular, can you believe this? Asked for them, not the government forces, they, yes, to come to augment, but they wanted the genuine to go inside Yemen to fight the Houthis, because why? Because they can go in and do some things and do maybe disrupt a lot of things inside Yemen that the government forces cannot do. So they sent the genuine into the RSF into Yemen to fight the Houthis as well. Because they are armed and powerful because they have the backing of Jazeera Arab, most of the, uh, especially Saudi Arabia, the wealthy financiers. There's many people who finance the, the RSF, many. So you have this historical, you have this ancestral connection between the Fulani herdsmen and the Afro Arabs of, of Western Sudan, the intermarried. And when they form this force, now they call them the genuine to fight the green and blue blacks, which you heard me talk about last week. You see the complications that we have. The government says, no, you cannot run this country because you are outsiders, meaning translation, your daddy is Fulani, your mommy is Fulani, and you mix with them, so therefore you're not real Sudan. You see the complication we have, brothers, that you have to understand what's happening here. Before, they were their brothers, okay? Suddenly now, when they're vying for power, they say, no, 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 you're an outsider. Uh, you got Sudani heritage. I mean, you have you have Fulani heritage. You're not real Otto. And so now you have this conflict. Now, the, the, okay, the Fulani, uh, okay, let me get up this thing here. Okay, yeah. The, the Fulani structure Includes, you know, pastors, uh, 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 brothers, and some who are what we call the Futa Fula. They they are city, uh, they dwell in cities and so forth. Uh, then you have also that nobody really talks about. Remember, brother, sister, I talked about the Seven Eleven, the Jihad, this to even to the present day. You have some of the Fulani people are nothing but warriors. It's something handed down in our people, okay? Because I'm Fula as well that we have a class of these Muslims who fight. They want to fight, they want jihad. So they have a warrior class. And this is what is some of the problems that you have today that in Northern Nigeria from the herdsmen, because the sex, there's a section of the herdsmen who are warriors and they're fighting. See, this is adding to the mix in Sudan. There is a mythoc. There's a, there is a brotherhood, there's a kinship, uh, uh, ancestry kinship between the RSF, again, and the Fulanis, because they're mixed with them. So this is something, again, why, brothers, sisters, this is a very, very dangerous, dangerous situation. Now, oh, that's last one, excuse me here, okay. Okay, where's the, okay. Now, you see this map here, brothers and sisters. I wanna give you a picture of something. If the RSF takes over, 
in the dark blue there. They have Fulani kinship with the Fulani herdsmen and other Mujahideen groups who are Fulani. Those in that light, like, you know, I'm almost colorblind. I'm an old age. It's like purple or black blue. I'm not sure. So forgive me if I, I can't distinguish, but it's not dark blue. And you see, they have this connection. In the brown is, again, I talked about other players who are not related. And this is the Azawa, who are the, the, the Tuareg brothers, Afro uh, Tuareg. And then you have the Afro Arabs, who are the Ansardine, as you see in the legend here, which is small, I know, but I pointed it out there. Brothers and sisters, the aim and ambition probably most likely will be the Sudan will be again. You think about this, brothers and sisters, from 7 11 to the present, this will be the new Fulani state because the RSF are mixed Fulani. Yes, they call themselves Arabs, but they're essentially they're not that, they're they're mixed group, and we call them Fulani Afro Arabs. That's, that's what you, I guess, you can call them because they've adopted the Arabic language. They take control of Sudan. It's, this is going to be a big, big, big issue. It's going to be widespread. And you're going to have things that's happening that's going to really cause us to, to really think on what's going on. Now, uh, as you heard me say here, the, the RSF have troops to control Sudan. They have the troops, brothers and sisters. They have the troops to control and run Sudan. And what makes this union so dangerous is this RSF, you know they're going to take care of the cousins. That's what, you, you, you know how black people are. We take care of our family. Don't we? We, we have cousins. We take care of our cousins. You know, this is how this situation is. Because their cousins are the Fulani herdsmen and other Fulani. Futa, Fula, Ful, and, and so forth and so on. All of these people are all related. And now... They're going to look for them to inspiration. Perhaps even they will assist them in what a new jihad to carve out new states. This is a possibility, brothers and sisters. And if you see that light blue or purple, I'm not sure what you call that. Portions of Chad may be taken out. Niger will be taken out. As you can see that other little small that area here, that as you go to your left, Niger and Arabic there I have. And then you have Burkina Faso. Half of Burkina Faso will be taken by the Fulani. You'll have a new Fulani state, and you have a, uh, you have a uh, additional Fulani who would be what? Connected to the RSF who will be running the Sudan if they win this battle. You see the complication that we have in Sahel, in the Sahel region, brothers and sisters? And nobody talks about this because, again, that's why I'm talking to you now. Because when you read, you read one thing, it's confusing. They say this is their Arabs, and that's all you know. But again, if you if you are a black man, you kind of you you, you say, well, wait a minute, well, who is this man's daddy? You know, you know how brothers are. So we we want to know the kinship. So now I'm giving that kinship that you're not gonna find from the Washington Post and others, because they're racist. So not they're not gonna give you a full picture, and you sure are not gonna get it from the US government because they are aware of this. Now the portion here in the red are also part of the 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 genuine, but they are scattered bunch. They're causing some problems, but they're in South uh, Sudan, but they're not causing as many problems because they're not they don't have the security forces yet. But brothers and sisters, if the RSF take the dark blue, you can rest assured. I got a funny feeling that they'll begin to annex portions of South Sudan, and we're going to have a real big problem on our hands. Because South Sudan is what? A green, black, blue, black state. That's right, brothers and sisters. They're mainly Nuba people. You see the complication that we have here. So you look at South Sudan. If the RSF, our Fulani brothers, take over Sudan, I have a feeling they will, because there's been hundreds of years conflict between the green, black, Blue black versus the Arab, okay? The Fulani Afro Arab or the Arab villages. There is just conflict. I told you about those conflicts when I was there. When I tested people, I started to ask them questions. I said, Can I marry? Because I, I told you, I saw beautiful green, blue, black girls. Oh, outstanding. Off the charts beauty. 
out of curiosity, I said, well, okay, these are Muslims. They said, you can't marry them because you're Otter. This is what they was telling me. You got to marry in this group here. In other words, stay in your lane. You can only marry the Afro Arabs. You cannot marry the blue black or the green black girl. You cannot marry. So that's, well, it's silly, isn't it? But it's starting to break down. But in this case, it's still prevalent. If the RSF takes over, brothers and sisters, look for South Sudan to really be in trouble. The government is falling. They got Mujahideen groups that are there. They got ethnic other groups who are fighting to take control. The RSF is powerful enough, brothers and sisters, to take them out. And I can see them possibly even annexing South Sudan or more, or maybe the, the, the northern portions of it. I can see that. As we go to the east, the, 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 light, the light purple, or light purple or blue there, this is their Fulani cousins, the Fulani herdsmen and so forth and so on. And I'll get into those people in a minute as well. But I, I have to uh, give this little bit of education so that you can understand what is, uh, uh, you know, what is happening. And uh, this is uh, this is something that uh, is is very troubling uh, for us uh, in today's uh, arena because uh, the uh, the RSF uh, is is a very very strong uh, uh, Fulani Afro Otto group. As you heard, this one, we, we should call them because that's what they are. They're Fulani Afro Arabs. So uh, they're Fulani heritage, but they adopted our Arabic culture and they speak the Arabic language. So this is how I look at them. This is what I call them from what I look at history and so forth and so on. And, and the, the, the ethnic structures, this is what I call them, the Fulani Afro Arabs. We have true Fulani in Sudan, about 300,000 of them. They're clearly Fulani. As you know, as you see on the map there, they speak a Sudanese uh, 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 full, uh, full, full language. Okay, it's distinct. It's distinct. It's mixed. Pular is it's, it's, it's mixed, but they have a distinct dialect running there. And they're clearly Fulani. But the other ones who have mixed from the 1800s are now Fulani afro Arabs. So I hope they, that you can get the picture and understand uh, what that means. Now, What if the, the RSF government, what would it look like? It'll be a Mujahideen government based mainly on the Sharia law. Would the Western powers in Russia accept them? No, they will not. They'll do everything to stop them. As they have everywhere else where the Sharia law is going to be there, they will go after the, the, the RSF. But they're going to have problems. Why I say that, brothers and sisters, because they have raging fires everywhere in the Sahel region. As you look from the left to the right, all the way down to Mozambique. 25 African states are mired with Islamic insurgencies. The Russians are in Mali uh, as we speak. If you look in the brown here on the map, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Russians are there. They're famed Wagner group, who is a mercenary group. They're getting their butts kicked. And the man even went on TV to talk about that. He got quiet when they asked him, what, are you making headway? They're getting their butts kicked. See, so... Again, brothers and sisters, the, the situation in the Sahel is so complicated and it's so massive, it's going to take a lot in order to knock it out. And you, they won't be able to because the Muslims are too many. The insurgencies are too many. And then they won't be able to do it. In this situation here, we're talking about possibilities. We're talking about possibilities that something may happen if the RSF do take over. These are possibilities that may happen. They may unite with their cousins to the east, which is the, the Fulani herdsmen. They just might do that. And you're going to really have something going on at that point. And let me, you see the boundary there in the brown. You have, remember, the, if you don't know these groups, I'm naming them today, not as a glorification. So you, for your, for your edification, not glorification, but for your edification, the, the, the Azawad are the Afro uh, Tuareg. Okay. They're running mostly some portions of Mali as we speak today. And then you have the Afro Arabs who are who? The Ansar Deen. They're both serious Mujahideen groups. They've been switching back and forth on who's taking control of, of Mali. They're also switching to take control of Burkina Faso. This is where we have the problem surfacing between the Azawad, the Afro Tuareg, 
the Afro Arabs, the Ansardin, and the Fulani uh, Mujahideen groups. We have a problem there. My understanding is they put a border and said, look, you take this, you can have it, but don't step over here going to the east. You're going to have to deal with us. And the RSF, if they begin to back their Fulani brothers, this is going to be a nasty situation. Or maybe they may come at conference and they say, look, uh, our brothers, our, our Fulani brothers, you go ahead and take the portions, you take that in Niger, you can have it and you can take little portions of Burkina Faso, you let us have to the West. I don't know what's going to happen to this, but these are possibilities, brothers and sisters, that we have to talk about and we, we should be educated enough to talk about this so that way you'll get a bigger picture. Because when you pull up the newspaper, it's so confusing. The Arabs are doing this, the Arabs are doing that. And you're trying to say what, and then you see pictures of people, some are blue, black, some are green, black, and you're trying to figure out well, what's going on. These guys don't look like Arabs. I know what's being said, and it's confusing. And then suddenly you hear, you see this guy who's a blue, black, he speaks Arabic, but he's not classified as Arab. Then you see one person who's like African-American, he's classified as Arab, and he speaks Arabic. It's confusing. So here I'm, I'm breaking it down so you can understand who is Arab, who is Afro-Arab, who is Fulani Afro-Arab, who is not Arab. I'm breaking it down for you. The, the green black, the blue blacks, the Nuba people, they're not classified as Arab, even though they speak Arabic language. Many of them do, you see? So now you see the complications and the danger of, the, of this situation if the RSF do get it. Now, I'm not pulling for anybody. I don't want anybody to misconstrue me. Yes, I'm Fulani, yes. But I'm not pulling for anybody in a situation like this because we have brothers and sisters who are dying and who have been displaced. See, so I'm not, I'm not asking for anybody. All I want is peace and to have stability. What I want is I want the tuba out. I'm not going to make no, no myths about that. I want the tuba out because they fuel everything. They put gasoline on the fire and then when it's begin to spread, they, they vanish. And this is what has happened in Sudan. So uh, the uh the uh yeah okay uh now i'm looking at some portions of here uh okay um i'm going to i'm going to talk about some other things here and then i'll close because i'll open up another section on this to give you even more of what's going on now let me say this to you brothers and sisters as the sudan crisis looms on check to the west and look at burkina faso that's going to be something that you have to look at because it's interconnected and then look at what's going on in northern nigeria and other places as well now the fulani herdsmen are are, are people that uh again they have to organize because you know what is happening you have groups who are assassinating the the Fulani communities, okay, the Fulani community, we know that they're, they're burning, burning out many villages, killed many, and then there's conflicts between the herders and the, the, the and the farmers. Okay, we know all of that. This this is part of this. They begin to formulate groups, known as the Fulani herdsmen. This has graduated to there's thousands of them, but there's a military wing who are very very ultra violent. They'll go into areas where the Fulani have been mistreated, have been burnt out, have been murdered. And the Fulani herdsmen, known as the Fulani who Jejui, come behind to what? Fight Hausa, fight Evo, fight any ethnic groups who have harmed the, the brothers uh, in the Fulbe community. They come in and do the same thing that what was done to the Fulbe community. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm not saying anything to it. I'm just giving you what is happening to it. So you can get a better, better picture on what's going on in that regard. And um, uh, the, in all retrospect, the sale crisis, Sudan is part of this because it's in, it's in, the, it's in the Sahel. In all retrospect, the Suhad crisis groups involved are mainly Fulani, are cousins to the Fulani 
genuine in question. And, and this is a great example of this. The Sudani Jedwin and the, the Fulani Jedwin are cousins, as you heard me say. Why this is important, brothers and sisters? Because I have a feeling, a gut feeling by history, because they have, they share cattle, they, they share pasteurization, they, you know, they, they, uh, they love for the open and they like to, uh, to uh, go, you know, move their cattle and graze land. And plus, they are warriors. They all these Afro Arabs in the eastern part, I mean, excuse me, western part of Sudan and the Fulani are, are, I mean, you know, they have the same type of culture. So why they don't mix? Here's the Fulani man comes over with his cattle and his family. He suddenly he's encountering in Chad and some portions of modern day Sudan, another man who is speaking a different language, but he's a black man. He's doing the same thing as the Fulani herdsman is doing. He sees the man's daughter. This is how this happened. And they begin to mix brothers and sisters in that region there. This is why if you look at the RSF, even the general who's running it, they all look Fulani. Now there's other blacks. Now there's some green blacks and blue blacks who have joined the fray, yes, and are assisting the RSF. We, you know, there's some there and they have others who are assisting there. But I'm talking about the historical and the heritage of these people come also from Fulani. So we have the afro Arabs and Fulani, they mix, and it's what you have as the RSF today, and they just might win and take that government. But you can rest assured, the Russians and Americans will stop that. They're not gonna wanna see that, brothers and sisters. They're not gonna wanna see, they're gonna fight to prevent that from happening because perhaps they see what I'm seeing and they probably already calculating that the RSF will come to the aid, maybe under the table of their Fulani brothers, the herdsmen, when they start to make, and other Fulani groups, and as they start to make their push westward, it'd be a new jihad stretching back to the 1300s where the, where the Fulani did before. They started new uh, sultanates and emirates. The Fulani been doing this, you know, for, for many, many centuries. I see this shaping up in modern times today because the RSF is gonna take Sudan by the sword. They're not gonna be taking it by, by uh, you know, some agreement. They're gonna take it by the sword. This is what the Fulani have done for all these, these hundreds of years. They've taken things, when you, when you go kill them off, they go and take the, the, the thing. So, okay, you want to do this? We're going to fight to the death. So they end up taking these areas by the, by the, by the sword. And this is what's happening in Sudan today. That's why the government is asking for the, 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 the RSF, our Fulani brothers, to put down their arms and surrender. What do you think is going to happen when they put down their arms and surrender? They're going to be killed off. You'll probably find some in American custody, some in Russian custody, and some will be disappeared, so forth. They know better. They're not going to do that. And, and, a, and a joint government uh, with them is not going to work either because the, gov because the government forces are mandated by, the, by the, the American intelligence agency and government. They're going to want, what, democracy, uh, uh, democracy and, uh, and the, 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 our brothers, the RSF, they don't want that. They want to go by the Sharia, you see? So we have a big mess there in Sudan, brothers and sisters. Uh, and hopefully... We hope that peace will come uh, to our, our uh, to our uh, to our brothers there, and that uh, uh, you know. And I, I want to touch on this, and I real I will close this. The ties and strengths and support from the Fulani uh, herdsmen are lending support to the RSF. Don't think they're not; they are. They're helping their brothers, the RSF. Don't you think they're going to reciprocate that help for the Fulani herdsmen? They will. I know the Fulani. They will do this. They're going to, they're going to go to their cousins and say, hey, man, when you start to do your jihad, I'll start to assist you. I won't be able to do it openly, but I'll do it under the table. And they will do this to assist their brother. The Fulani herdsmen, you don't think that they're involved with the RSF today? You must be kidding because the Fulani are there. Okay? They are there. They're inside RSF. No doubt about that. See, so the ties, strengths, and supports from the Fulani herdsmen and afro arab clans and the Fulani afro arab clans, the Jazeera op, this is a mess, brothers and sisters. I know, you say, Arab here, this one says, this is Sudan. Welcome to Sudan. This is the mess that I'm talking about here. This is Sudan. It's, I mean, you have to have a play card to understand it. This is Sudan. 
So now what I want to push here, brothers and sisters, is this. And I'm going to put this out to you. The RSF in its current structure and strength is strong enough to take out Boko Haram, which I believe they will. This is my opinion. This is my opinion. And I also believe that the wayward Fulani groups now who are robbing, waylaying, we, we call Muharaba in the Arabic language, okay, Muharaba and so forth and so on, they will galvanize them. They'll bring them on and say, hey, man, you join us. Because they won't continue, they won't allow them to continue to do what they're doing because they're going to want a, a, a jihad that's correct under the Quran and Sunnah. Some of our Fulani brothers are not operating under the Quran and Sunnah because when you go and rob the house or village and you go and kill their people, that's not operating that. Even though, yes, maybe their husbands are involved in killing Fulani, but you have no right to go to the house or village or something in our, our house of brothers and you kill them outright and kill their women and children. Even though they did this to you, you have no right to take this kind of revenge, see? So these wayward groups like this will be brought into speed. But what I look at is, is again, as bring up this map, when we start to look, go to your left, the dark blue is Sudan. You start to see the light blue, purple, whatever it is, okay, brothers and sisters. You start going this way, Boko Haram is in the way. They're in the way. So now I believe that they will take them out because they have no use for them. And I believe they're strong enough to take them out. And if you look at the, the, the small area of northern Nigeria right here, this is where possibility and maybe even the Cameroons and even maybe the, the Central African Republic is where this may happen. And the Boko Haram is not easy to take out, but you need another Mujahideen group who knows them very well and know their hideouts to go after them, to bring them up and say, hey, look, man, you're going to have to stop what you're doing. All this kidnapping, running in, into to, to Fulani areas and to the house areas, and you're doing this, kidnapping their daughters, you got to stop this. They're going to say, no, man, we want to run our own show. I think they, there's going to be a war that's going to happen between them. And I believe the RSF with the backing of, I mean, the herd, the Fulani herdsmen with the backing of the RSF will be able to take out the Boko Haram. I see this. I, I really believe this, brothers and sisters. I believe that they can take them out. And this is why the complication in the situation will be something. And the RSF will not be easy pushovers. The U.S. and the Russians will not be able to be allowed to rule them indirectly like they have done for so long in Sudan. They're not going to tolerate that because the RSF, even though the, the, the Jazeera Arab states are controlled by the West, still they're not going to be easy pushovers. Because why? They're in jihad. This is a different, the, 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 the Jazeera Arab states are not in jihad. These guys are in jihad. And when you're in jihad, it's like your blood is up. You've been fighting, you've been killing. So when they finally take something over, you think they're just gonna hand it over to, to, a, to a disbeliever? I don't think they will do that. The disbeliever is going to take it by force. And if he does take it by force, he's got the other elements he has to contend with. And it's so big, he's gonna run his risk of causing more fire, more gasoline poured onto something, and you're gonna have even, even a greater, greater uh, fight on your hand. So this is why, brothers and sisters, this case is not easy. And you look at it in English again, you get a better picture, all of Sudan run, run by, by the RSF. Part of the southern part of Ch uh, Chad may be annexed or unofficially annexed. And then you have northern Nigeria, maybe a battleground, and maybe going to the Central African Republic, all the way down to the Cameroons, maybe a battleground in the future for this situation as well. For the Fulani herdsmen and the RSF will fight the Boko Haram. And then you go further west again now. We go leave Nigeria, we go north to Niger. Niger is finished. Whoever is the, will get the spoils will take Niger. Niger is weak. It's impoverished. It's, it's, uh, it's being run by the French in particular, but the Fulani have claimed that. They say, hey, we have ancestral lands there. 
We have many herdsmen there. This is our place. They've already told the, the, the Afro uh, Arabs and the Afro uh, Tuareg, this is our place. We're going to take this. So this is, again, shaping up to being a nasty situation. And then we go into Mali. Mali, as you saw on the map, I showed you in Arabic, the brown. You see now Mali in yellow. The Aswad will be taking, the Azawad, excuse me, will be taking some of that and the afro Arab group and Sardine will take this. Now, I will close at this point. The famous, two infamous groups, the AQ, okay, we all know who the AQ was, remember, Bin Laden, okay, Rahim Allah, him. Then you have the, the, uh, the infamous IS group or ISIS group. They're all over the place as well. They cannot do much in a situation like this. They cannot. They can only uh, mastermind a few little things here and there and that's all. They don't, they're not strong enough and they can't get the recruits enough to take any large portions of land. I believe perhaps that they may end up having a war with the Fulani herdsmen or the Jesuit and the RSF. I have this feeling that that may happen, brothers and sisters. I have this feeling that this is a possibility that this may transpire as well. So what's going to happen, the West may be sitting back in the wings watching the brothers duke it out for territory. And if the Fulani end up winning all of this, you have a new jihad state, and jihad state meaning the states were taken by the sword we're not talking about jihadists, not the American word. I'm not talking about that because that's that that is an evil word to call another Muslim. But they will take these states by force, and we will have a connection between again Sudan, be RSF, be be a uh, Fulani Afro Arabs, part of Chad, Northern Nigeria, be in the mix in that they will be with their brothers. But Northern Nigeria is. Uh, left alone. It's not going to be annexed, brother and sister. Don't get me wrong. It won't be annexed. Niger will be annexed. Uh, half of Burkina Faso will be annexed. And that's where we'll stop at this point for the Fulani Arab, I mean the Fulani uh, factor in this particular uh, situation. So you see the situation, yes, you talk about Sudan, but you got to talk about all the other stuff to, to, to understand it as well. Because the Fulani are, are, are intermixed with this brothers and sisters. So I'm hoping, brothers and sisters, that you got something uh, to a better picture and backdrop of what's happening in the Sudan region. When you look at programs, brothers and sisters, and they, 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 they show Sudan, now you start to understand. When they say Arab, you ask the question, especially if this coming, these programs come from America, they're, they're coming on, on YouTube. And when they start to talk, some of it's not even right. But when they begin to talk, you start asking questions in the chat. Well, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Who's what? Who's fighting? What village group are you talking about? You have to ask those things of the, the, the person who's hosting that because you don't want to be misled. You say, look, it's not right. Don't mislead these people. Who are you talking about now? You say Sudan is, do is do doing what? Who's involved in this? Now you understand who's involved. you got the government forces. You had the RSF who were the former uh, Jesuit, remember? And they're what? Fulani afro Arabs considered to be what? Outsiders. Now you understand. The government forces are afro Arabs as well, but they consider themselves to be true Sudanian and true Arabs, where they consider the Jinduit, the RSF, not to be true Arabs and not to be Sudanian. Complicated, isn't it? Because they know their daddy is what? Part of the heritage is Fulani. You see, again, brothers and sisters, now you have a picture, you'll understand, look like I'm kind of breaking up because uh, you can imagine, uh, I'm a pretty, I'm a popular on YouTube today, especially with with the, the American government, because they don't like for me to talk about issues like this to educate our people, our African people, about this situation. But brothers and sisters, when you see these programs, you ask those questions. Okay, don't be misled. If you have questions, please ask asking me. I'll try to do my best to answer those questions. And one more thing, I will close, brothers and sisters. I had a brother write me the other day. And he went round and around with me, and, and I think my one of the programs I talked three weeks ago, and he was he was way out of base. W what we're having now is that some of these groups, and I question if they may be too bad. He start he picked certain things of what I said inside the chat. He didn't look at the program, and he went at bat to try to draw me out to get me into a, a argument. 
he argued me about who were the first black Africans to be Muslims. Was the Hausa or the, the Fulani? So we went round and round. I tried to explain to him. I said, but the issue here basically is about Andalus and what happened to Andalus in the seventh century. He didn't want to touch that. Then he went to that because he started to pull up books and he started talking about it and he said something. And this is what I'm talking about. He said in the seventh, eighth century, ninth century, basically, the Fulani people were Tuba. Yeah. Now you you understand what I'm talking about? He said they were Tuba. That's ridiculous. My great great grandmother was never Tuba. Okay, she was taken out of out of uh, and she was she was Fulani and Amazir. She was black because my great my grandmother I saw her own eyes. She was black. She was not Tuba. See, so uh, brothers and sisters, when you when you you know, please I entertain anything, but please get your facts right. Don't say the Fulani people were Tuba uh, uh, 1,400 years ago. That's not true. They weren't Tuba. Okay, and who was this? Who was that? We're not marred in that because. Uh, we only go by with the historical thing. He was trying to tell me that the house of people were the first ones Muslims. Then he said the house of people were the ones who basically were called the Moors. It's not true what he said. Because if this is the case, why is it that the Moroccans, who are the front runners who went into Andalus, why do they have Fulani blood? You see what I mean? Because he doesn't understand his history. They have Fulani blood and all. All the kings of Morocco, the, all the sultanates, they were either very, very dark or light brown, but they had Fulani heritage. Okay, that bottom line, the Moroccans that you see today, irrespective of their light skinned, have Fulani heritage, not Hausa. And I kept telling him that. I said, Well, how do you explain this? I kept, he, he started talking about something else. We, we should get away from that. Okay, I was very respectful of my brother, but when he said that the two Bob were basically, I mean, that the, the Fulani were two Bob in the early stages, I, I said, This is enough. Stop it. I had a feeling that perhaps he was actually too bob himself trying to get me to say something. And so I, I shut it down. So brothers and sisters, I will conclude this segment on this talk and I will add more to what's happened and I'll get more into the second part about the Fulani herdsmen. Okay, I will get into that in a later date uh, here, inshallah, bi'ifnillah. And I'm hoping that you got something out of it. And those brothers and sisters um, who, uh, oh, thank you, my dear brother, uh, 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 Giovante uh, Miller. Thank you, brother. Uh, my brother uh, Mustafa here in Morocco. Salam alaikum, rahmatullah katu. Uh, my dear brother uh, Mustafa and Amina, thank you for showing up. Thank you for those who will show up in the, in the near future as well, and those who are looking. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm pleased, and I'm I'm very immensely happy and proud that uh, my brothers, sisters on the continent, in particular, and African Americans in America are supporting my, my program. I really appreciate that immensely from all of my African brothers and sisters everywhere where they may be. So I will leave you with that. Salamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.